Good morning, LifeCo. Got my fan club up front. Good morning, good morning, LifeCo. How are you today? Are you good? Can I just say, I love our church. I was thinking about it this morning, and I was so thankful every week that we get to come in here and we get to do life together. And I love it when my son had a basketball game yesterday, and Shemaine came and watched my son play basketball, and I thought, I love doing life with my church people. I love doing life with my church people. So listen, are you thankful for your church today? Come on. How many of you are ready for January, the longest month of the year, that feels like an entire year to be over? I'm not a January girl. I have to take lots of vitamin D and sit in a lot of lights, and I don't like it. I like sunshine, and I'm ready for better weather. Today, before I start the message or go any further, I want to highlight our crew launch that is getting ready to start. I don't know if you've ever been in crew at LifeCo, but what I want to tell you is you are missing out if you are not in crew. There are a couple areas in our crew system I just want to highlight really quick for you before I jump into the message. We have three areas in our crew system. We have activity where you can go hiking or scrapbooking, or we have an amazing soccer crew that meets, that has so much fun. Or maybe God is challenging you in the area of friendship this year. We have a friendship category. Maybe he wants you to get some real good godly friendships in your life and step out in that area. And then we also have our study category where you can do Bible studies and grow deeper in your relationship with Jesus with one another. We also have our pastors, Pastor Lenny and Pastor Scott. How many love Pastor Lenny and Pastor Scott? Come on. They're the real deal. They're going to, again, do our set-free course that is going to be available to you and our relational living one taught by Pastor Scott that's going to be amazing. So can I challenge you today, if God's speaking to you, ask him what of those three areas he wants you to grow in, and can I challenge you to sign up for a crew today? In true alley fashion, gifts is one of my five love languages. I have all five. They're all equal, and gifts is also one of them. My husband loves it. It's great. He just wants to know today what gift is it. And sometimes it's two or three at the same time. Um, When you sign up for a crew today, you get a gift. You get to spin the wheel and you get a gift. So we would love for you just to dive in, be a part of our crew system with us. It's an amazing opportunity and we're going to have a great crew season. Hey, we've been in a series called Progress, and Pastor Kyle has done an amazing job with the series that we've been in. And I don't know about you, but I've really enjoyed the series that we've been in. We all want progress in our life. We're all just trying to do the best that we can. And at the end of a year or the end of a month, we just want to see our progress. I... I was talking to someone earlier. I don't like New Year's resolutions. They kind of they kind of bother me. I feel like it's just set up to fail. You put up this really big New Year's resolution. And so I really don't personally do New Year's resolutions. But someone, I was talking to them, and they said, Allie, have you ever thought about doing ins and outs? And it's the first time I'd ever really heard about that this year. And basically what it means is what do you want to take in to 2024 with you, and what do you want to take out? And I thought, man, that's such a good way to to look at that. And when I really started writing that down, I realized it was the very small things in my life. The small things that I wanted to take in and the small things that I wanted to take out. You know, we've been in this series called Progress, and Pastor Kyle preached last week. And kind of how he ended his message, I want to pick up today as a part two. And today I want to talk to you about how to have a healthy root system. That's the title of my message today, a healthy root system. I'm going to start in Colossians, and you can read along with me, Colossians 2, 6 through 7. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is living, that it is active, and that it is available to us. Today, I ask that we would just lean in to what you have for us, that we could just for one minute hit the pause button on our upcoming grocery list or the meetings that we have or the tough conversations that we have, but we could just pause in this moment and lean in to what you have for us, God. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your faithfulness, and most of all, God, that you'd be glorified above all all else. I want to kind of start at that scripture in Colossians. You see, Paul is talking to the church of Colossae. 
in this passage that he's writing. I don't know if you read about Paul a lot in the Bible, but Paul, one thing I love about him is he's constantly reminding us who we are in Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I need someone who's reminding me who I am. And so Paul's having this conversation with them, and he's saying, guys, listen, you've said yes to Jesus. Good job. You did it. Now, I need you to continue in the faith. I need you to continue in what you're doing. And I need you to be rooted in. I need you to dig your roots down deep in him. But I also need you to be built up in him. Okay, about a building, when we're building something, what's the most important part of a building? It's the foundation, right? It's the foundation, that our foundation is built on him. So we have rooted in, built up in, strengthened in the faith. Remember what you've learned. Remember what I've taught you. Remember the gospels. You see, people are going to come and they're going to tell you all kinds of different information. You've got to be established and strengthened in the faith. And then he says you're going to be overflowing with thankfulness. You see, if we're rooted in, we're built up in, and we're strengthened in, the thankfulness just comes. We're overflowing with it. We can't control it. We can't stop it. Growing up, my dad, uh, I've talked about this before, but my dad was a landscaper. So he did landscaping by trade. And I, I'm one of three girls, and we know an awful lot about sod and mulch and trees and plants. More than I care to know, more information. Like, I'd be riding in the car, and my dad would be like, now, Allie, that's a Bradford pear over there. And I'm like, well, Dad, where are the pears? Like, I don't see any pears on the Bradford pear. He would be like, Allie, there aren't pears on there. And we would talk about it. And my dad um, worked at a landscape company. And one of the things that my dad used to do that I have a vivid remember remembrance of is transplanting trees. Transplanting trees or transplanting bushes. And I remember my dad telling me, Allie, you can't just transplant a tree. There's a process to transplanting a tree. You've got to water it several days before. You've got to nurture it. You've got to check the soil. You've got to be invested in the process. I mean, you can imagine I'm eight riding in the car like I don't really care about a tree and planting and uprooting. I remember one day specifically my dad at our house was trying to transplant a bush, a small little bush. And when I went outside, I saw my dad's white pickup truck with a chain attached to the bush. And I'm like, is this legal? Are we allowed to do this? And my dad said, well, we can't just pull this up by our hands. And I'm, I'm like, you can't pull it up by your hands? And it was the first time that I experienced seeing a root system. I sat there and I watched as they put the chain around and my dad got in the truck. I think he thought he was pretty cool. And he was driving and as he drove, the root system came up. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, that's huge. Like, I, I can't, I didn't even understand. It's bigger than the bushes. It's the first time I saw a root system. Today, I want to kind of part two Pastor Kyle's message and talk about a healthy root system. See, I could talk up here for hours about a healthy root system. I'm not going to do that to you, I promise. I'm going to let you go to lunch. Or we could talk weeks about a healthy root system. But I want to tell you three thoughts today on developing a healthy, nourishing root system. The first thought I have today for you is abide. See, the word abide comes from the New King James Version of the Bible. If you look in NIV or NLT or other translations, you're going to see the word remain. I'm going to read John 15, 4 through 8. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So what does it mean to abide, to remain in him? I looked at the Greek word, and the Greek word is meno. And meno means to remain, to abide, to stay, to continue to be present, to be held, kept continually, to live and dwell, to wait. 
abide. The part of the scripture where he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. You think, you see, I think he's getting straight to the point right there when he says, abide in me. Abiding in Jesus is our responsibility. It's our responsibility. And I think sometimes when we look at that scripture, we get really concerned with the fruit that we're going to produce. And we get really distracted about the fruit. You see, the fruit isn't our responsibility. The fruit's his responsibility. Our responsibility is to abide in him, to remain, to stay, to dwell, to live continually. His job is the fruit. Abide in me and you have fruit. Fail to abide in me, you have no fruit. You see, when we fail to abide by him, we don't look like him. The more that you and I choose to dig our roots down and abide in him, we start to look like him. And I don't know about you, but I want to look more like Jesus every day. I want to abide in him so that I can look more like him. I want to know his nature, his character, his heart. I want to know the truth. I want to abide in him. There's a story that reminds me of abiding, the word abide. My family went to Washington, D.C. My older sister and I took our boys to the Washington, D.C. Zoo. And our boys were, her son was eight, my son was five. We were so excited to go to the zoo. We could not wait to go to the zoo. And we got there and we had it all planned out. We were going to different exhibits, looking at different things. And I remember getting to an exhibit and I remember saying, hey, where's Colin? And the minute that we said, where's Colin? You can imagine it's like sheer terror, right? In anyone's heart. We couldn't find Colin. Here we were in Washington, D.C., at a zoo, and we lost an eight-year-old. And so we panicked. We frantically went in all different directions, calling his name, looking for him, crying, very upset. And I remember seeing my dad at one moment run, and I saw my dad run towards Colin. He had found him. And when my dad got up there, Colin ran to him, and they embraced, and it was a beautiful embrace. But the lady that Colin was with, he was with a man and a woman, and the lady looked at my dad, and she said, Sir, I can see that he loves you. I can really see that. But I'm not going to be okay to release him to you until I see a mom whose name is Amy, who has blonde hair, a pink shirt, black skirt, and a stroller. And my dad said, no problem. I understand. Around comes Amy. We have a reunion. We left the zoo. We weren't much interested in the zoo after that. What does this story remind me? You see, Colin knew his mother. He knew her. He was able to describe her very nature, who she was, the details, the information, because he had such a good relationship with her that he could explain who she was. You see, when you and I abide in the Father, we can explain who he is. We know his character. We know his nature. We know his heart. Why is it important? Because we need to know our Father. If we don't abide in him, we don't bear fruit. But past bearing fruit, we don't know him. We don't know his voice. When we abide in Christ, we produce lasting fruit. John 15, 16 says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might grow and bear fruit, fruit that will last. He chose you. You don't just get to abide in him because it's the thing to do. He chose you. He chose you to abide, to dig your roots down deep in him. You see, abiding, it really addresses our proximity to Christ. It addresses our posture and our place and our proximity. When we really look at our lives, what are we firmly established in? What are we abiding in? I don't know how you feel, but I was challenged writing this message I came up with some things that I shouldn't be abiding in that I am. Abiding in my future. Abiding in what's next. Abiding in a sermon podcast. Rather than just digging my roots down deep and abiding in him and his word. Abiding deepens our roots. It deepens our roots in him. 
You see, when you and I abide in Christ, our hearts are cultivated for growth. The power of his truth uproots misconception, confusion, as we hide God's word in our heart. I want to say that again. The power of his truth uproots misconceptions and confusions as we hide God's word in our heart. He prunes away any wayward or distracted thoughts as we abide in him. We serve a God of kingdom principles. Our earth that we live in does not observe kingdom principles. They do not observe kingdom principles. And as you and I choose to abide and dig our roots, dig our roots down deep in him, the truth becomes more clear to us. If our, we are not abiding in him, it's hard to see the truth because his truth uproots misconception and confusion. So some kingdom principles, I call them upside down principles too. The world says, exalt yourself and climb the ladder of success and move every, but knock everybody out while you're doing it. God says, humble yourself so that you can be the one, he can be the one to lift you up. 1 Peter 5, 6. The world says that he pushes us to live in division with those that are different from us. But God says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Matthew 5, 4. The world says death is the end of the story. But God says he used the death of Jesus to bring life. And he promises death will never again be the final word. Romans 6, 9 through 11. The world tells us how to fit in. God empowers us to be set apart as different makers. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Side note, the world has lost the definition of set apart. They've lost the definition of set apart. The world yells, live your best life now. God says, this life is fading and your best life is the one yet to come. James 4, 14. I don't know about you, but when I read about the kingdom principles, I want to dig down deep so that I can abide in his word, abide in his kingdom principles, and I'm not confused by the, what the world is saying. If we're not nourished and rooted in him, we're going to be confused, and we do not serve a God of confusion. Amen. Abide in him. Dig down deep. The third thought is consistency. Consistency. Daniel 6.10 says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows, where the windows were open towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees, knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he has done before. Consistency. I read a book um, that John Maxwell suggested called The Compound Effect. The book is kind of a, a, a success book. It's, it's, it's a great book. It was recommended to me by John Maxwell. And The Compound Effect is a book that has a principle that suggests this. The compound effect is small, consistent actions or changes when repeated over time can lead to significant and exponential results. So this author is actually preaching faithful with little. He doesn't know it, I don't think. But he's preaching faithful with little. The compound effect. Even if you and I are not clear on what exponential is, we need to get excited because we serve a God that wants exponential for our lives. We serve a God that wants exponential in your families, in your marriages, in your finances, in your jobs, in the teams that you lead, in your money, in your mind. We serve a God that wants exponential for you. But here's the thing. You don't experience exponential by doing exponential. You don't experience drastic changes by doing drastic changes. You, you actually pursue them by small changes over time. Consistency compounds. Consistency compounds. Okay, so I might not be able to change my destination today, but I can change my direction. I can change my direction today, which over time will change my destination. I might not be able to change my relationships today, but I can change how I treat people 
today. And over time, my relationships will change. I might not be able to change my physical body right now, but I can change what I put in my mouth today and what exercises I do today, which over time will change my physical body. I might not be able to change my spiritual state right now, but I can just start talking to God today. Hey, I need you. I'm not where I'm supposed to be. And over time, it will change our spiritual state. Consistency. Do you know anybody that cold plunges? I know a few people that cold plunge. I'm actually kind of interested in it myself. It's got some really good health benefits. I'm just a big baby and I don't want to do it. Um, but the, I hear the same thing from everybody that cold plunges. So I have some friends that do it. I've looked at online advertisements. I hear the same thing from everybody about cold plunge. So if you decide you want a cold plunge, you, you get in this tank of negative water. Why anyone would do it, I'm not sure. But you get in it, and the goal is to see how long you can stay in there. And some people literally cannot even get in for a second. Some people can get in for three seconds. Some people work themselves up to 10, 15 minutes. But here's the thing about cold plunges. Everyone has said the same thing to me. You have to start slow, and you have to be super consistent with it. I've run into people that cold plunged that have said this to me. I was away for vacation for two weeks, and I got to go back home and get in the cold plunge, and I got to start all over again. Because what works with the cold plunge is the consistency of every single day that you get into the cold plunge. Consistency, starting slow, day after day. The enemy is after your consistency. If I tell you one thing today that you walk away from this message, the enemy is after your consistency. He's after your consistency. He's scared to death that you are going to become consistent in your marriages, in your finances, in your church attendance, in your job. He's scared to death that you're going to do that. The enemy is after our consistency. You see, when the devil can't stop us from doing the right thing, he's got a next step. He gets us to do the right thing the wrong way. When he can't get us to stop doing the right thing, he'll get us to do it the wrong way. When he can't stop you from wanting to do big things, he'll try to get you to do big things the, sm the wrong way. You don't do big things by doing big things. You do big things by doing small things consistent actions or changes when repeated over time can lead to significant and exponential growth. And when we do that, when we're consistent in it, all of a sudden we hit this season where we're doing big things like they're little things. We're doing big things with a grace and a strength like they're little things. Consistency. I saw a, a woman on the Today Show that was really defeated about her body and her weight and everything that she was doing. She tried multiple things that she failed over and over time, diets, exercise plans. Someone said to her, what about running one mile a day? Walk it first if that's what you have to do. One mile, 365 days a year. And she did it. She started one mile, 365 days a year. Do you know what she did not do? Six months in, when she was crushing that mile, I mean crushing it like she could do it in her sleep, she did not say, I'm going to do five miles today. I'm going to I'm gonna run a marathon. She did not say that. You know what she did? 365 days, she did one mile. At the end of the, her journey, she absolutely lost a ton of weight and got her physical body in shape that she wanted. But you know what she said? so much more of her life became better because of the consistency of that one decision, one mile, 365 days a year, that she stuck with it. One mile, 365 days, and she stuck with it. In the Bible, I love the consistency of Daniel. It says Daniel prayed three times just like he always had. Where do you think Daniel learned to trust God? Do you think he learned to trust him when he was thrown in the lion's den? 
He learned to trust him when he was abiding in him, when he was consistent. And if you read the story, it, it was a little challenging that day. A decree had been put out. He was told you can't pray. Sounds like a little bit of a storm, right? He went upstairs. He lifted the window up. He knelt down and he prayed. Daniel operated consistency even when the storm was blowing. Even when the storm was blowing, he said, no, no, I'm going to pray to my God no matter what. Our struggle with inconsistency, we hear this word warfare and everyone's like, oh, warfare. Don't say it, Allie. Our struggle with inconsistency is warfare. Our struggle with being consistent with what God has put in our hands, it's a tool of the enemy. How do we grow in our consistency? One of the things that's important to me in consistency is to know your why. Why are you being consistent? Okay, so you might say, I want to be more consistent in my finances. Okay, great. Why? Well, I have a few things I need to get at Target when I leave here. <laughs> Does anybody have a few things at Target they just need to get? I want to go on vacation, and I would really like to get my hair done. <laughs> You get that hair, Jasmine. You get it done. Or how about this? I am sick of living paycheck to paycheck. I want financial wealth for my kids. I want to train them in how to have good, godly finances. See, you got to know your why with what you're trying to be consistent. Because if you don't know your why, that's when inconsistency comes. The enemy is after your consistency, and he's scared to death. Right now, even in this room, I'm up here talking to you, and I hear the Holy Spirit say, hey, Allie, you know that thing that you always talk to me about? Like, it's the first thing on your list when we pray. You, you, you complain about it, and, and it's constantly something that you bring to me. Are there some areas in that that you could be consistent? There are some areas in that that I can be consistent. Small, consistent actions or changes when repeated over time, can lead to significant and exponential growth. The third thought I have today is mentors. There are two scriptures I want to read to you today. First Thessalonians 5.11. Saying Thessalonians is a very hard scripture to say. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Proverbs 15.22. Without counsel, Plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. Mentors, if you and I want to build deep root systems, healthy root systems, nourishing root systems, we're going to need some mentors in our life. You see, some of my most profound moments of my life were when winds and storms were coming, and I said, you know what? I'm done. I'm uprooting my root and I'm going. I'm uprooting my root. I'm uprooting my root and I'm going. But you know what was so powerful in those moments were the mentors that came into my life and said, hey, Allie, just a minute. Just stay just for a minute. Just abide. Just trust. Don't, don't, don't pull up your roots right now. I promise you right now I wouldn't be standing on this stage if I didn't have mentors in my life that came up to me and said, hey, I just want you to stay for a minute. I just want you to trust for a minute. You see, we live in a generation where we think we can just do everything on our own. We don't need any advice. We're the smartest one in the room. We know the decisions. And when the storms come, and they're going to come, and the winds blow, they're going to blow. It's a promise. you got to be able to dig down deep. And you got to have somebody that can come alongside you that says, you know what? I've actually been there before. I actually have more experience in this than you do. I've weathered some storms before. I've actually weathered some droughts before. I've seen presidents come and go. And I've, and I've been good and I've been faithful. We need mentors in our life. You see, they've experienced more in life than you and I have experienced. We need mentors in our life. 
There's a lot of um, examples in the Bible of mentors. Jethro mentored Moses. Moses mentored Joshua. Joshua mentored the remaining leaders of his army. Eli mentored Samuel. Samuel mentored Saul. Elijah mentored Elisha. Elisha mentored King Joseph. Daniel mentored King Nebuchadnezzar. He humbled himself before God. Jesus mentored 12 disciples. Sometimes he mentored three. Sometimes he mentored one. We're going to want to quit. We're going to want to give up. We're going to want to uproot. We're going to want to. How do I know? I've wanted to do it plenty of times in my life. And I've needed those people in my life that come alongside me and say, just a minute, just a minute. And in just that minute, that's when you start to begin to grow your roots down deep and they become healthy and they get nourished because every two seconds you're not uprooting to something else. If we're uprooting to something else, our roots can never grow. Who's your mentor in your life? They change in all different seasons. God always seems to bring the right mentors that we need if we'll trust him. He always seems to bring the right person. And what I want to ask you today, is the mentor in your life nourishing your root system and growing you deeper in your relationship with Jesus? Or are they uprooting you? Are they uprooting you? Because you really have to take note of who the mentor is in your life and the mentor you're called to be. Are you nourishing and helping them grow down deep towards Jesus? Or are you encouraging them to uproot? We can't grow down deep in him if we're uprooting. Who do you have holding you accountable? Consistency and abiding, it re requires accountability. Abide, consistent, mentors. There are a lot more ways to build a healthy root system, but I promise you, if you take these three things and you do the small actions or changes over a period of time, you will see exponential results. Exponential results. Don't believe the lie that you have to do something so big to make a difference. It's the small little changes. The reward for us comes in Matthew 7, 16 through 17. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from those bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. When you and I work towards a healthy root system in Jesus, when we abide, when we're consistent, when we allow people to speak into our life, the reward is we bear fruit. The fruit's his job, remember? We gotta focus on what our job is. Abide, consistent, mentors. I don't know where this message speaks to you today, but maybe there's one of those areas that's God saying, hey, I just need you to abide in me. You're listening to information from everyone else. I just need you to stop, to abide in my word. Hide it in your heart so that you know it, so that you're not confused. Or maybe it's, hey, this area of your life, you've got to step up the consistency. God challenged me this week so much in an area of consistency where I was just complaining and frustrated. And you know what it really comes back to? My consistency in the situation. It comes back to me. God's given me everything that I need. I just gotta be consistent with what he's given me. Or maybe today, the mentor part is what's resonating with you. And God's saying, hey, listen, you're gonna do really big things. You're gonna accomplish really great things, but you need mentors in your life to help you. They help you, they help your root system. It's not just so they can tell you you can't do the wild thing you wanna do. 
Maybe they do tell you that, but it just for a season so that you can plant your roots down deep. Abide, consistent mentors. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your word today, God. God, I thank you that you love us so much, no matter where we are in our life, God. God, we want this year for our church, for Life Co., we want to build a healthy root system in you. God, thank you for the tools that you're giving us to do that, God. God, would you help us to learn to abide in you, abide in your word. God, be consistent with what you've given us, faithful and consistent with the few, not looking at the big things, but just consistent with what's in our hand. And God, would you bring mentors into our life that can help us dig our root system down deep and nourish it in you. God, would you help us to be the mentor that we're supposed to be for someone else? We love you, we honor you, in Jesus' name, amen.